Today we are going to be covering The Art of Profitability by Adrian Solowatsky, and as I mentioned in part one, I believe this to be the single greatest book that has contributed to my knowledge as an entrepreneur, and it is a must-have for any aspiring entrepreneur. In the book, Adrian Solowatsky covers 23 different case studies that analyze different businesses and how they make their profits, so let's jump back into it. Okay, so today the first framework I'm going to be covering is Blockbuster Profit. And no, I don't mean Blockbuster Video, may rest in peace. What I'm talking about is when a company comes out with a product such as the iPhone. And for those who don't know what it means to be a blockbuster, you can relate it to the adage of blockbuster films, because that is exactly what Marvel has been doing in the recent years. Marvel has put a ton of time, money, and effort into sculpting various different films and intertwining them all within the same universe. Their newest film, Deadpool, became one of the biggest blockbusters yet, earning the title of the second highest grossing rated R movie of all time, just falling short of Matrix Reloaded's benchmark. Deadpool ended up grossing $600 million in its first month. And that's the kind of return you want to get on a blockbuster product. Another example of a blockbuster product is the Ford Edsel. And as you increase the scale of the project, you also increase the risk. And as you increase the risk, you also increase the reward. Some blockbusters are incredibly successful, such as the iPhone and the Marvel films. However, some products flop, such as the Ford Edsel, which I talked about in one of my previous videos. Blockbuster products also have the propensity to deal a disastrous hit to the companies that put it out. That is why, for a lot of smaller companies, this isn't a viable plan because it could be life or death. So let's say that your company makes motors and you are looking for a way to expand the company. You seem to have reached your growth potential and you are wondering what there is that you could do to increase your span. Well, since you specialize in motors, you could start making car motors, and boat motors, and motorcycle engines. And that's exactly what Honda has done. This is what is known as Profit Multiplayer. Profit Multiplayer uses the same concept, like the motor, and applies it horizontally across different adaptations. But even further than boat motors, or car motors, or motorcycle engines, you can further specialize the motors for streetcars, Formula One, crotch rockets, dirt bikes, etc. Now, let's imagine that you're the owner of a small B2B business, and it doesn't matter what you sell, what matters is that you're selling it and you want to sell more of it. So you decide in pursuit of that goal to fly into another state to negotiate a deal. You're a cool businessman so you spend $500 on the business class seating and wait the 4 hours it takes to travel. Once you land, you pay for a cab to drive you to their office, all goes well and the meeting is over within an hour's time. You're an even cooler businessman now, so you pay for the taxi to take you back to the airport where you drop another $500 on a business class seat back to your home city. Why did you just spend an entire day and roughly $1,200 on an hour-long meeting? Why couldn't you have done this over the phone in a conference room in the same amount of time? That's the rationale behind entrepreneurial profit. Entrepreneurial profit is essentially being frugal with your business decisions. Not only does it save money, but it saves time. Some companies like Walmart take this framework to the extreme, but Walmart more so does it out of necessity because if they can't get the lowest price, then they lose market share. And even if Walmart saves only a penny on each of its billion products on the shelves, that's $10 million saved. Even on the smaller scale, like with the plane and the conference call, entrepreneurial profit saves time and money. When we think about Microsoft, computers instantly come to mind. But what we don't think about is that for the most of Microsoft's life, it didn't even make computers. They only just recently began making tablet computers and Surface Books, which I never heard of before until I did my research for this video and I won't even get into the horrendous specs of this device. Also, didn't Steve Jobs always complain about how Microsoft ripped off the Macintosh? With this new Surface Book, Microsoft is being a lot more conspicuous about it. But anyway, back to my point. So Microsoft sells one of these Surface computers and takes a 6% margin or something like that. Is that enough for a company like Microsoft? Of course not, Microsoft is a computerless computer company. The Harvard Business Review actually wrote an article with that same title in 1991 where they talk about how Microsoft strategized making the de facto operating system to become a dominant player. They knew that by making the software for the computer, Microsoft could be the standard across nearly all computer makers as opposed to just being another computer maker. And they make infinitely more money off of the software applications for their products. Look at both these pictures. Microsoft has been in bed with Adobe for several years now, which is why, in every advertisement of the Surface, you will see Creative Cloud products running on the newest version of Windows. Not only does Microsoft make huge money off of that deal, but Office is so pervasive that even Mac users need to buy it. This is what is known as installed base profit, where a company produces a product and uses it as an avenue to restrict buyer power and sell more products with much higher margins. 
If you like the sport of basketball, then you surely watch professional and college games. Hell, you might even play on a rec team. So let me ask you this. Which would you buy if you wanted to fit the image of a basketball player? Would you buy Beats or would you buy Sennheiser? What about brands? Let's talk brands. Are you more likely to buy Nike or Reebok? I think I know the answer. Beats headphones and Nike sports products are the de facto standards. Their products have become the standard in the eyes of several different demographics, and their products market themselves now because of it. This is obviously easier said than done, but becoming the de facto standard means that you will save uncountable amounts of money in the long run. And there are only two real ways to achieve this, and that is A, a great product, and B, great branding. If you think that the de facto standard is something reserved for top dogs, take a look at Under Armour. Under Armour came out of nowhere and became Nike's biggest rival in what seems like overnight. If you took a look at their financials, Nike still obliterates Under Armour, but you would never know it because Under Armour is also a de facto standard. Being the de facto standard means, among many other things, your product markets itself. And this is something that I will be discussing in great detail when I cover Seth Godin's purple cow in the coming months. So to reiterate, in these case studies we went over how companies develop blockbuster products such as the Marvel franchise, how Honda utilizes profit multiplier to sell the same concept in several different adaptations, how becoming more conservative with your budget can make a company, how one product can be a platform for several more profitable products, and finally, how becoming the de facto standard not only saves a company millions of dollars, but also allows it to stay ahead in the game. Thank you guys for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. Also, let me know what your thoughts are on this video. Not a lot of conversation is going on in the comment section, and I'd like to change that. Thanks everyone.